Hello and welcome to the course SY40302, Special Topics in Biotechnology. And in this lecture, we will be discussing the detection and diagnosis of RNA viruses. As a reflection, looking back upon the pandemic, it was something that took us all by surprise. And one of the reasons for this was that the countries did not have the mechanisms to share data as well as the policies to share data. Had the country shared data, the early detection and diagnosis would have been possible and this would have prevented a major outbreak as we experienced. So having said that, how will we handle the next crisis and what are the ethics of sharing public data? In this lecture, we'll focus on the implications for the early detection and diagnosis of viruses or other pathogens, which may have a significant impact on public health and safety. And we'll focus primarily on the molecular methods because these are what are known as the gold standards. And they are the most useful methods for the detection of future viruses, both in terms of reliability and reproducibility across labs. In this lecture, we'll discuss the current molecular methods which are available in the market. We'll discuss the applications of the guidelines from the World Health Organization for the detection of RNA viruses. And we can also apply this workflow for the development of new methods to detect novel RNA viruses. Upon completion of this lecture, you should demonstrate the ability to design an approach for the diagnosis and detection of RNA viruses using multiple methods within an established set of guidelines. Now, what this means is that you should be able to use your existing knowledge to improve a method, and that method has to be established within a guideline or a procedure. And this procedure can then be replicated across other laboratories. Which means that if you develop your method in a laboratory in Sabah, you can share it in any laboratory across the country or across the world. Now, what are the various methods that are currently available for the detection of viruses or any pathogens? The first one is microscopy, the second one is immunological, and the third one is nucleic acid-based methods. So let us look at these methods. When we look at microscopy, we have the conventional microscopy, which can be used for the detection of bacteria, but not for viruses. To detect viruses, we have to go into the level of transmission electron microscopy or electron microscopy. The second method is immunological method, which is the ELISA method, in which you have the antibodies from the patients interacting with an antigen. And the third method is the nucleic acid method, which relies on the DNA or RNA, which has been isolated from the pathogen. Now let's look at microscopy, the advantages and disadvantages. Now, in order to observe a virus under the microscope, you have to isolate the virus in the pure form or what is known as the exanic culture of the virus. This is very difficult in patient samples because the Patient sample, which is generally serum or blood or tissue isolates, will be contaminated with other particles, which may be viral particles or it may be other bacteria and so on and so forth. So in order to achieve a pure culture, the virus has to be isolated firstly from the patient sample in the pure form and then cultured in compatible animal cell lines in the laboratory. Now this procedure is risky. After you culture it, you have to confirm that the virus is in the culture by using the RT-QPCR, which is a reverse transcription, quantitative PCR, or immunohistochemistry, which is ELISA. And you have to prepare the sections using microtomes. So if you have cell lines, you have to mount them and you have to interpret the images after the scanning electron microscopy has been completed. Now, the problem with this method is that there can be a lot of similarity between the virus particles as well as other components of the cell. 
This is a picture of the 1918 influenza virus, which was cultivated recently. You can refer to the link. And this is a classic scanning electron microscope. So they actually revived a virus from the 1918 influenza virus, which caused a lot of mortality across the world. Now, this is an image which shows you the complication between the rough endoplasmic reticulum, which appears to be a virus, and the virus. So in this kind of images, you require a real expert who can identify viruses purely from imaging. And this is a challenge in many countries where there are no established experts or virologists who can interpret SEM images or the TEM images. This shows another virus particle within a cell type and you can see the clear demarcation of the virus as compared to the other components of the cell. Now certain components in the cytosol may also look like viruses and this can lead to confusion. So in the context of microscopy as a diagnostics tool, it is, has a low diagnostic sensitivity you require experienced professionals and the throughput is low because for every sample that uh, has to be prepared, it needs a few hours for preparation of the sample itself. And if you go in for cell culture, it may require weeks or even months. Now these are some of the references you can select or just click on the link and you'll go through those references. You can find these links in your lecture notes. So we now move on to the nucleic acid methods, which are the more reliable, reproducible methods, which require a low level of expertise, laboratory expertise. So we have the DNA-based methods, which can be used to detect DNA viruses, and we have the RNA methods for the detection of the RNA viruses. Now, with these methods, we can detect extremely low copy numbers of the virus, which can be from 5 to 10 copies per cell. They are very specific, they are very sensitive, and they can be reproduced and transferred across diagnostic laboratories. This is what happened during the pandemic, during the early 2000, that was in February. There was no method which was standardized, but as the pandemic progressed by around April or May, uh, standard method was available which could be implemented across laboratories. So we use, utilize these methods in Sabah as well as across Malaysia and the methods basically are developed by the NIH in USA and other agencies such as the Pasteur Institute in France. Okay, so there are also other methods such as isothermal PCR. You can again click on the reference and you can be guided to the reference in the lecture notes. Now this is an isothermal PCR, which means you do not require a PCR machine. You can carry out the amplification at room temperature. It's a very useful method, but again, there have been issues related to reproducibility and the matrix effect. Now matrix effect refers to the primers for the PCR interacting with other components of the cell or the patient cell. There's another method called uh, reverse transcription, which is a LAMP PCR. So it's a loop mediated isothermal amplification method, which can detect viruses. It can be adopted to microfluidic technology, which means that you do not have to handle the sample at any point in the diagnostic procedure. It's handled entirely by the robot. But the problem with this kind of technology is again, reproducibility and reliability. Okay, so this is an example you can uh, reference has been given to you so a patient swab or a patient swab sample or even a serum sample or blood sample you just transfer it into the viral vtm so we call we have a fluid for the transport of these viruses it's called a vtm once you have the swab in the vtm it will transfer the sample into the uh, into the lysate so everything is lysed in that sample and then an rt lamp is used so it's basically a procedure which detects the virus from the patient sample using isothermal pcr this does not require a pcr machine now microfluidics is 
an approach which is being adopted in most laboratories, which means that the process of pipetting and heating the sample is not done by a human operator. It's entirely done by a machine. I can give you some links to my YouTube channel, which shows you what kind of machines we use in our laboratory for microfluidics. Now, the method which was used during the current pandemic and which is the best available method for future pandemics is what is known as reverse transcription, quantitative PCR. And this is considered as the gold standard for multiple reasons. In this method, the total RNA is isolated from the patient sample. It is reverse transcribed with specific prim primers and the reverse transcriptase. cDNA is amplified using specific probes. The method is reproducible across laboratories and thermal cyclers and the sensitivity of detection is enhanced by the application of what are known as probes. Let us look at how we apply this method. Now this is a typical graph which I will describe in the class and it shows you what is known as the cycling time and the cycling fluorescence associated with that cycle time. Now after 15 cycles in the machine you can detect the virus and if the virus is at low titer we will detect it at the 25th or 30th cycle. Now, the earlier you detect the virus, what it implies is that the copy number of the virus in the patient sample is high. If you detect it at a later stage, the copy number is low. So 15 cycles will indicate a relatively high copy number. If it is 30 cycles, it may indicate a low copy number. Now this is very important to the doctor or the physician because he or she has to make a decision on the patient's medication and therapy based on the viral load. Another important element or graph in the RT-PCR method is the melt peak. Now if you have a single melt peak as you can see the green peak is single peak and that indicates that the primer is specific. However if you get multiple peaks or not sharp peaks it may indicate that the primer is non-specific. I will Describe that in the future slides. Now, the RTQPCR method relies on a nucleic acid stain, which is known as cyber green, which binds to double stranded DNA. However, this method is not as sensitive as the next method, which relies on something known as a Techman probe. I will describe this in detail in the class. But I will show you how to design a probe using the Primer 3 software in the class. Now Primer 3 is a software which can be used to design probes for specific regions of DNA or in this case cDNA because for an RNA virus we convert the RNA into the complementary DNA template and then we detect it using primers designed for DNA. For example, if you have a template sequence, we copy and paste the sequence into the primary software and the primary software will detect the probes. So you'll have the probes which are designed for the detection of the viruses. So if you click on that link, primers, you will obtain a list of the primers for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Now the target genes may vary based on the different kinds of viruses. So in this detection, for example, in the COV SARS viruses, we generally target the RDRP gene. Now this RNA dependent RNA polymerase gene, as I mentioned in the earlier classes, is very important for the replication of the RNA. So once you detect this gene or if you detect this gene in a sample, it implies that there is an RNA virus which is of the SARS category. Then we have the E gene and the N gene. Now this E gene and N gene which is referred to the envelope protein gene 
and the nucleocapsid protein gene respectively may vary from virus to virus. For example, if you had the MERS virus and you have designed a set of primers for the MERS virus, those primers will not work for other coronaviruses or respiratory viruses. So this primer design has to be specific to the genome. And this is why it's very important when you have the first outbreak, you must obtain the genome sequence. Okay, now the limit of detection, how sensitive is the RT-QPCR? So for the RDRP, it can detect up to 3.6 copies of the gene, which means that if you had three copies or three viruses which are intact in a cell, you can detect it. And the same is for the E and N genes. Okay, now there are various reasons you will ask me, for example, why is RDRP more sensitive as compared to N? And the reason may be because of the complexity of RNA. Because RNA is single-stranded, it forms complex structures and we, when we convert it to cDNA, it may not necessarily be efficient and that is why there are differences in the sensitivity. This is the reference for the article which will take you to the sensitivity study. You can click on the link in your lecture notes. Now, when we design primers for specificity, we should be aware of three things which happen. One is the mutation in the gene. So, if there's a mutation in your primer binding site, the primer will not work. And that has happened in many cases in which you, case you get a false positive or a false negative as the case may be. Then there's lineage. So, the viruses vary by lineage, what you know as the alpha, beta and delta variants in the current case. And then you have variants. So, variants may even be present in a patient. For example, one patient sample may contain two variants if he or she is infected with two viruses. So mutation can be in a single point mutation and it can be synonymous or non-synonymous. It can affect the coding sequence. Now, when mutations happen frequently, they create problems for laboratories for detection because the primers have to be redesigned by modifying the bases. Now lineages are groups of closely related uh, viruses. So there are multiple lineages and again this must be considered when we develop the diagnostic methods. And finally you have the variants. So a variant which in a viral genome may be uh, caused by a single point mutation or multiple point mutations. And among variants, there are two types of variants. One is the variant of concern, concern which means that that variant is causing increased morbidity or mortality or having more infectious potential in a population. And there are variants of interest. These are not necessarily linked to increased morbidity and mortality or increased transmission. However, they may evolve into variants at a later stage. So these are variants of interest, as I described earlier, and variants of concern. Okay, so variants of concern are, for instance, we are working in Kota Kinabalu, and we suddenly find there is an increase in the morbidity, which means more and more patients are being hospitalized. Secondly, what we note is there's increase in the transmission of the virus, more and more cases. So what is done in this case is that the laboratory will sequence the viruses isolated from patients with increased transmission or increased severity. And after sequencing, they will map these sequences to the databases. And if there is a variation, this particular variant will be considered as a variant of concern. Concern because it causes increased mortality and increased morbidity. And then you have the variants of highest concern. That is why you have certain variants classified as alpha, beta, delta and so on and so forth because they are causing severe mortality and morbidity in the public health system. Okay, now one of the probes which is used 
in the detection of coronaviruses is the TechMan Pro. So if you are aware of PCR, polymerase chain reaction, we generally use two primers. So you have the forward primer, which is in green, and the reverse primer, which is in red. Now, TechMan probes are far more specific. They use a third nucleic acid sequence, which is known as a probe. And that probe is linked to a fluorophore and a black hole quencher. Now, what happens is that all of these three primers, which is two forward and reverse primers and one probe, so there's a three primers, should bind to the sequence in order for the reaction to proceed. If any one does not bind, the reaction does not proceed and you get a negative result. Okay, so all of the three have to bind together. Now this improves the specificity of the detection method. In the class, I will expand on this discussion and show you how these Techman probes are described. Okay, so let's have a discussion in class on this particular topic. And we look at the Techman probe itself. So we have certain criteria such as the annealing temperature, the length, the GC content, the GC clamp, the amplicon length, the runs and repeats, and uh, genomic DNA avoidance. Now I will teach you how to design this probe in class when I expand on the discussion into the TechMan probe. Now when we interpret data from the RT-QPCR, there are various approaches. And we have to look at the graph which is generated by the thermal cycler. So one of the first things which you look at is the RT or the, the time at which the curve begins to break off from the normal point. And usually we try and adjust our diagnostic methods or the concentration of our template so as to get a signal at around 14 to 15 cycles. Okay, at 14 to 15 cycles, we detect the inflection of the curve. So in this case, you will see the yellow and the green curves. So that's an indication of the standard. Now, when we use a standard, we have to be careful because when we have a patient sample, it will definitely not comply with the standard. But we need to do a standard or set up a standard in order to determine the copy number of the virus. So we use a known copy number of virus, we dilute it and we conduct a RTQ-PCR on that sample, you obtain a standard curve. Once we obtain a standard curve, we know the number of copies of the virus which correlate with the fluorescent signal or the cycle time. And we then use that as a baseline to compute the patient's viral load. Now the third element as you can see is something known as a melt curve graph. Now when we conduct a melt curve with the RT-PCR machine, we have to ensure that we have a single peak. If you have multiple peaks and not a single sharp peak, it implies that your method is not specific. Now in the clinical samples, we have certain considerations. I have prepared a video link for you. And this is an actual video link in the laboratory. So if you are working in the future in any diagnostic laboratory, I have demonstrated how you work with a patient sample in the laboratory. Please take note that the link, right? The video may not be of high quality because I'm wearing a biosafety suit when I recorded this video. And the microphone is inside the biosafety suit and there's a sound of the blower of the, of the biosafety suit. There's a fan inside, so you can refer to the video and I will explain to you how the sample is handled, the patient sample from the viral transport medium or VTM. I have another link which shows you how the microfluidic system works. You can click on the link and it will take you to the demo of the microfluidic system. This is used to extract RNA from patient samples without exposing yourself to the virus itself. There are also other methods which are very common nowadays, which are the immunological methods using the COVID-19 test strip. However, these are not really reliable because they are bound to error. There are methods which rely more on ELISA and biosensors, but all of these methods are not really Mainstream. The mainstream is the RTQPCR method. So 
ELISA based methods are also recommended but they have limits of detection and then the process is tedious because you need to prepare the sample you need to bind it to the plate you need to add a blocking buffer and you need to then use a sandwich method so it's very time consuming and expensive LFDs are the most common method now we are all familiar with LFDs they are used in the testing of the sample what is known as a rapid test kits there's a link there which will take you to a youtube video again on the LFD system itself but primarily when we look at diagnostics we look at the rt q pcr rather than these other systems then we have the immuno pcr this combines pcr with the elisa method which increases the diagnostic ability and then you can also get higher sensitivity and specificity okay so this is the antibody capture method which uses pcr there's a link to the reference below again these methods are laboratory methods which are in development and they are not mainstream and you have immuno pcr now when we work with a new virus we actually step into what is known as the unknown we don't know the the sequence so we basically have to start off with the rdrp which is the sequence which is shared with the most viruses shared at rdrp sequence now this is a case scenario which may happen or in the future we never know so if there is a index case or the first case is detected in a patient in a specific uh, state in this case Uh, i have given an example of epo parak detects a new case of the virus and you have the same cases reported in other case uh, states such as kota kinabalu and kuching so sabah and sarawak then you look at the epidemiology or the transmissibility of the virus and then you you address it simply by first sequencing that virus I, isolate you look you sequence it once you sequence it you can then go into the design of the primers as i have described in this lecture and you can develop your method for the detection of the virus before you deploy it so you have to begin basically by detecting the causative agent then you have to look at the approach for example is this a virus or is it a bacterium and what are the symptoms and what are the molecular methods so you have to sequence it obviously and then you trace the origin and the genotype Now the World Health Organization has developed specific guidance for laboratories. Okay, they have the laboratory guidance for detection and diagnosis of the novel coronavirus infection and the interpretation of laboratory results for COVID-19 diagnosis. So this are the standard references which are currently available to manage future pandemics of coronaviruses. However, with the increased amount of surveillance in the world today, there is a high likelihood that any variants will be detected early and will be contained that's important they have to be contained or restricted to their geographic region so to summarize as you finish your final year of study in biotechnology some of you may be working in laboratories in the future and some of you all may be tasked with the detection and diagnosis of viruses and in fact some of you may be working for biotech companies which are on the forefront of developing diagnostic methods because the company which develops the diagnostic method in any pandemic is the one which generates the maximum coverage or in terms of profitability the profit from that particular pandemic so we look at early detection is the key all companies strategize for early detection rapid detection which is fast with high throughput because you'll have thousands of patient samples Uh, we have re reproducibility across laboratories the method should be reproducible whether in, you are in saba or malaysia or anywhere in the world the same method should work across laboratories and then it becomes acceptable and your method should also take into consideration new mutations lineages and variants now when you develop the method you should be aware that there is a fine line between specificity and mutation so if you have specificity you may not detect mutations however it will be very sensitive If you have mutations you need to modify the method. So that brings us to the end of this summary of the lecture. I will see you in class for those of you who can attend. Thank you very much for listening.